the Son of the living God. But don't lose sight of what happened a few verses later. From that time on, verse 21, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day to rise. That's not what Peter wanted to hear. Not what the disciples wanted to hear. And so Peter took him aside. Now remember, Peter has just acknowledged you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're God, right? But Peter's still going to take him aside and tell him how to do his work, you know? Say about that for a minute. You are the God of the universe. You created everything in it. You know every star. You hold it in power in place by your mighty power. You know every star by name and hold it in place by your mighty power. But on this, you probably don't really know what you're talking about. So let me take you aside and explain this to you, all right? So he takes you aside. And began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and he said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. Now listen to this. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. The problem we have in nine churches is that these people in these churches <coughs> set their hearts and their minds on the things not of God, but of man. And I know we say it all the time, but they want their plans for their church. Peter wanted his plan for Jesus' ministry. It's not going to be like this, Jesus. It's going to be the way we think it ought to be. And we run into that all the time in dying churches. Yes, we believe Jesus is the Christ. Yes, we believe the Bible. Yes, we do. But no, we, we are not setting our heart or mind on what God wants. We don't want to think about the suffering and the difficulty and, and getting into what uh, the agenda that others would have. We want what we want for our church. And so we say all the time, you're not going to revitalize a church until you revitalize their hearts. Until they decide to follow Jesus. And as he went on in the next few verses and said, if you want to follow me, you have to be willing to what? Take up your cross daily and follow me. Following Jesus is a life of sacrifice. It's a life of giving in to his leadership and his will. And I just can't say it often enough. When we talk about revitalizing and replanting dying churches, we are not talking about some quick fix church growth method of how you get people to attend a worship service. We're talking about how do you get people to lay down their agenda and what they want for their life and for their church and be willing to pick up the cross and follow Jesus no matter how costly it is. And the truth of the matter is that is the only pathway of joy they'll ever have. And that's what we are called to teach. And lastly, let you know that this is a spiritual battle. It was Satan who put that in Peter's heart. And your enemy are not the Contagious old men. <coughs> your enemy is Satan, who has gripped their hearts and blinded their eyes. And through the preaching of God's word, and through loving them, and through gospel conversations, and through shepherding them, you pray that God would remove the scales from their eyes and unclog their ears, so they once again would hear Him and see Him and fall deeply in love with Him. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that this is the message that we share and we are passionate about. We pray, Lord, for the freedom from the grip of the adversary among these and these churches that are so desperately in need of help. Lord, as we sing now to you, as we honor you with our voices, as we hear our brother, now we come, Lord, we commend it all to you.